the last part of the talk, the last message is this same thing applies to our experiences of being a self too. Just as we perceive the outside world as a construction, or we don't perceive it as a construction, it is a construction of our brains. The same applies to our experiences of being a self. It's also a kind of controlled hallucination. And in fact, there are many different ways we experience being a self. There's the experience of having a particular body and of being a particular body in the world. There are experiences of perceiving the world from a particular first person perspective, of making volitional actions, choosing to do this or that. And only then of being a person that has a continuous identity from hour to hour, day to day and year to year, that's associated with an I and a name. And then even beyond that, we can think about how I experience myself refracted through how I perceive you as perceiving me, the social self. Um, I'll just mention a couple of things about the bodily self to show you that it's also a construction based on the brain's best guess of the causes of body-related signals, another kind of controlled hallucination. Now, you may have seen this before. This is the, the rubber hand illusion, which is a beautiful illustration of the brain engaged in this process of continually figuring out what is and what is not its body. So what happens in this, in this experiment is that the person's real hand is hidden from view and a fake hand is placed in front of them and then the experimenter strokes both hands simultaneously with a paintbrush. So the person is seeing a hand, which is, they know is not their hand, but it's roughly where a hand should be, it looks like a hand. They're seeing it being touched and they're feeling touch at the same time. So this is quite a lot of evidence for the brain that even though it's not my hand, it kind of, it must be my hand. And if you do this for a while, you develop the uncanny sensation that this fake hand is in fact part of the body. And there are many ways to test this, but this is the only really good way to test it. Um, works really well on children as well, I found. But, um, so, it works. You, know, you, can, you can convince the brain that you know, something as basic as what is our body is something that is, is malleable. And of course, many symptoms in following brain damage can... We see this frequently. People with phantom limb syndrome who've had limbs amputated will still feel the limb as being there. There's a, this, the mirror image of that is something called somatoparaphrenia. People whose limbs are still perfectly attached to their bodies, they experience them as not their limbs and desire their amputation. Um, and... This can even, uh, you can do, you can extend this in many different ways. This is uh, Maxine and, and Rennie at the British, the Brighton, no, the British Science Festival last year. What you do here is you have people wear headsets with cameras and you swap the feed so that now this person sees themselves through that person's eyes. And again, the key thing is when they shake hands, you get that multi-sensory congruence, which the brain takes as extremely powerful evidence. And suddenly you feel like you're shaking hands with yourself from within another person's body, the body swap illusion. You can even have out-of-body experiences. And I think there's a, you, know, you can look at yourself from behind and do the same sort of thing. And there's an important message here, which is that throughout the ages, people have reported things like out-of-body experiences and have often been sort of you know, poo-pooed by, by science. And this is wrong. People are having these experiences and they should be respected, but their explanations for these experiences should perhaps be not taken on board. It's not that your soul has left your brain as floating around. It's just that your brain has come to an unusual best guess about where its first person perspective is located by purely natural um, means. Now, there's experiencing the body from the outside. There's also experiencing the body from within. And this is typically... You know, if you think about it, this is a very basic sense of selfhood that we all have, this experience of just being a body. And this highlights interoception, which is an overlooked way in which the brain perceives the world. This is the brain perceiving the internal state of the body. A large amount of neuronal real estate is dedicated to perceiving and controlling its internal state. If you think what brains are for, they're ultimately just for staying alive. They're for keeping the body and the brain alive. Perception of the world around just sort of follows indirectly from that. Um, so we wanted to know what the, the implication of this interoception, this perception of the body from within, has for our experiences of being a self. One thing we did was a version of the rubber hand illusion, where now instead of stroking the hand with a paintbrush, it flashes in time or out of time with your heartbeat. And what we find is when it flashes in time with your heartbeat, you perceive it more as part of your body. So our experience of what our body is, 
is governed not only by signals from outside the body, but signals that are coming from deep within the body. Even if you're not aware of when your heart's beating, it's still influencing your perceptions of what is your body, what is yourself. Um, this looks like this in a, you know, you do this in VR again now, so here's somebody's hand. It's a bit jaggedy because it's quite old, um, and it flashes to red and back very gently. So our experiences of what our body is is also a kind of controlled hallucination. And that leads to the third kind of take-home message that with apologies to Descartes, you know, I don't think, therefore I am, I predict myself, therefore I am. Now, the last point I want to mention is also about Descartes, and it's really this idea that, that um, for Descartes, the fact that we're made of flesh and blood was rather irrelevant to the presence of consciousness or soul. You know, Descartes was keen for various reasons to reserve consciousness for humans. And so you know, if animals bleed when you, you know, when you cut them, that doesn't mean they have any kind of conscious awareness. Now, I rather think this line of thinking is taking us to the opposite point of view, that we have conscious selves, we are conscious not in spite of, but because of we are living flesh and blood organisms. Because the whole reason for having this predictive machinery that enables perception is fundamentally about regulation and control of the internal state of the body. Um, so thinking again about perception as this reduction of prediction error, we can either change our perception or another way of reducing prediction error is to change the sensation, to, to make an action to change what we perceive. You know, if I'm expecting to see a friend and I don't see that friend, I can either update my, my prediction or I can go to where, you know, go to my friend's house and verify my prediction that way. So I can make actions to make predictions come true. Even when I just move my hand, what I'm, another way to think of this is I'm fulfilling a prediction about where my hand ought to be. It's a self-fulfilling proprioceptive prediction. So doing this enables us to control. If I predict that my heart rate stays within certain range, it will stay there, so long as I use actions to make sure that prediction comes true rather than just update the prediction. Predictions can regulate. And so here's the, here's the last idea, which is that interoception, perception of the body from within, is not really about figuring out what's there, it's about controlling and regulating the internal state of the body. And this explains something, I think, about the difference between the way we perceive the world and the... When I perceive the world around me, it seems full of objects and the spaces between them. Talked about objects already. But the body, I don't perceive my internal organs in different places. You know, I don't perceive being a body as a kind of object. I just perceive it as something that's either going well or going badly. And I think this has to do with the different ways the brain is using predictions. When the brain uses predictions for control, we experience how well or how badly that control is going. When we use predictions to figure out what's there, we experience objects and things as the contents of our perception. So we can begin to really explain properties of phenomenology now in terms of different kinds of mechanisms. Um, and this is related to a bunch of other frameworks by Lisa Barrett and Carl Friston, um, and is not what Descartes said. But back to that point that conscious selfhood emerges because of and not in spite of the fact that we are what Descartes and Julien Lemaitre call beast machines. There's very close ties between mind and life. Um, and this just makes the point that if that's the origin of our perceptual mechanisms, then everything we perceive, whether it's things out there in the world or things in our body, are all grounded in these same basic predictive mechanisms that have their roots, origin, and ultimate explanation in keeping the body alive. We perceive the world around us because of our living bodies, with them, through them, and because of them. 